Hello and welcome back to the Explosion Network. I'm Kieran, your host, and today I'm joined with somebody you're probably a little bit familiar with if you've ever watched any esports whatsoever. Welcome to the interview for this week, Jordan Elfish Guy May. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Very good. Uh, obviously, just finished work, so it's a good feeling on a Friday night. So pretty excited to kind of get the weekend underway definitely it definitely is and um thank you very much for taking some time out of your day and not running straight home after a busy day at the office um so for anybody if they have never watched esports for some reason or uh, have somehow missed you when watching esports mm. can you just give a bit of a rundown of who you are um what you do and for a bit of an icebreaker question what is the game that you would say defined your childhood Ah, okay. Well, that's an interesting one. Well, so to, to kind of give a bit of a TLDR as to who I am, uh, I'm just a, a commentator here in uh, Australia. Uh, I've been working in esports for probably four or five years now. I mean, I really couldn't put a date on it, but uh, I'm definitely one of the first full-time uh, commentators in the country. Uh, there are a few more around the place. Most of them, uh, I think, are, are Riot employees, but I think I might be the only one that isn't a Riot employee uh, that is a full-time commentator in the country. Um, and actually, interestingly, on that topic, one of the, I guess, one of the games that did kind of influence my life the most probably was League of Legends, um, because it was one of the games that kind of got me into uh, casting and into esports. Uh, aside from that, uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2 was the, the first real love of my gaming life, and that was yeah. the first one where I sort of started to kind of compete in, but uh, yeah, certainly those two were big milestones for me. It's um, it's really sad actually. We went back as part of the channel a little while ago and went back to try and play Star Wars, and it, we was we weren't happy. We were like, oh, no. was this was this this not aged well? It is not no, it aged well. No. Absolutely not. I, I've had the exact same thing as you because obviously, like I said, it was one of my favorite games at the time. I was very, very, very into it when I was, you know, what, 12, 13, maybe. Yep. Uh, and I went back a few years later and uh, it's, you, you can barely play it now. Like yep. the hit rate is absolutely awful. The lag, latency is everywhere, <laughs> even though our internet's gotten better. Yep. Uh, but still, it, it has fond memories. It does. It does. And uh, it's good to look back at those games and um, the memories that they hold for us. So, so you said about League of Legends and how it got you into your love of esports, your love of casting. How how exactly did you start casting? Did you did you start it and think, okay, this is a career, or was it just something for fun because you had a lot of knowledge about a game you wanted to talk about while watching live games? Yeah, I mean, it's a fairly long story, I guess, but it obviously started off, I think, with as with most people, as as just a general degree of interest in competitive gaming. Uh, so I sort of started off, like I said, in Star Wars Battlefront 2, I was competing in a loose sense in that there wasn't too much of a competitive scene but i was playing in some scrims and that kind of thing at the time uh, but then that kind of moved into tf2 when tf2 sort of started to hit it big that was kind of like the first game that i really actively played in a league or anything like that i was never very good at it uh <laughs> but uh yeah i was playing a bit of tf2 and obviously that's sort of where i started to watch streams and i was watching uh some of the the top tf2 matches in the australian region at the time which incidentally i think has been part of the reason why i've kind of had an interest in overwatch there's a lot of similarities and a lot of players even that have come through from that time into Overwatch. But I guess that's a discussion for later on down the track. Uh, inevitably, I, I sort of picked up League of Legends as well. And that was where I think uh, the real esports boom, at least for me, uh, kind of hit because that was sort of around Season 2 Worlds time where it was really kind of getting big uh, around the world. And, and I was, again, watching some of the Oceanic region um, tournaments and matches and stuff. And I was watching some of the casts. And I've told this story a few times before, but I just didn't think that they were very good. Uh, I won't say necessarily who that was, but <laughs> at the time there was some guys that were fairly amateur um, and I didn't think they were too great. And so I thought that I could do better, which in hindsight I probably didn't, but, you know, it's it's kind of what led me down this path. So that was, you know, I just started doing it on my own Twitch channel, people watched, people noticed. So I ended up working for an organization called Team Down TV, which if you know Ben, who was another one of the yep. casters that I work with for yep. Overwatch, uh, that was, he was part of that as well. So, you know, we've all come from kind of humble beginnings. Even Uber Shouts uh, work for Team Down TV. So there's a lot of people that have kind of come from there and now have full-time jobs in the esports industry. And, and that was kind of the big leapfrog for me uh, into bigger and better things. And obviously now I'm here at ESL. Yeah, definitely. And I guess that's where all the best people in, in any field have come from is looking at what's already there and thinking that you can do a better job or that you can add something to that scene. Um, and so now you've you've got this way through your career and, and now you're the head of broadcast talent for ESL Australia. What What's changed in, like, say you've gone from just casting on and off for fun and just on the side to now this is your, your employment, your career. 
what's changed for you in this role and what's changed for you in how you act um, when you're casting? Well, I mean, a lot of a lot of things have really obviously changed, not just for me personally, but for the entire industry as a whole. There's a whole lot more money. Four or five years ago, this was not even an option. There was absolutely no one being a, a commentator in this country. And it was a very, very underdeveloped esports scene in general. Um, so, you know, the budget and the that kind of thing has really obviously played a big part in in my ability to have this role. But for me personally, obviously, it comes with a lot of more responsibilities and professionalism and that kind of thing. And, and I've obviously increased my skill as a broadcaster as well um, over that time. You know, I've done hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands. I don't know how many uh, broadcasts, but you, you certainly learn a lot. And so, uh, yeah, exactly. Like, like with that that, that kind of progression comes a, a lot more sort of responsibility in terms of, you know, you've got sponsor call outs and you've got certain things that you can't talk about on broadcast. When you're doing it on your own channel to 10 people, it really doesn't matter what you're yeah. talking about. But yeah. when you're uh, representing not only yourself, but an organization, maybe a company, even a game, uh, for you know, in, in, in the sense of like, for example, when we do Overwatch contenders, I would say loosely we are representing Overwatch. If, if a new viewer to come in and watch Overwatch contenders or something yeah. like that, if we were saying the wrong thing uh, on broadcast that would not necessarily translate well to a viewer's opinion about uh, that certain game so yeah. uh, there's a there's a lot of responsibilities and, and things that you need to be aware of uh, when you're on a broadcast now particularly for those more important broadcasts that we do tend to do yeah definitely especially with overwatch contenders because mm. blizzard is so well at least from the outside seems to be so heavily involved with um its organization running it's it's you've got to have that in the back of your mind at all times that um it, to an extent you're representing the game and the company that is um running so what is a day in the life of a caster and head of broadcast talent is what's it like really like what what is your day-to-day -day life for your position is it just organizing different events is it research um it's a bit unfathomable in you know from yeah five ten years ago where esports was barely on the map to even think that somebody could have a full-time role in in the industry like you do now yeah i mean obviously even five years ago when i first started commentating uh, to me a cast a night of casting or a day of casting was literally you rock up to the cast 10 minutes beforehand you sit down in your chair and you cast and yes. it's like whatever yeah. it's done as soon as it's done um but nowadays yeah it's it's a little bit more intensive than that so uh let's just say for for example i might cast three or four days a week uh of broadcast that other day you know if you typically work nine to five five days a week would be your standard job uh for me i do also work five days a week um it depends sometimes how many broadcast days i do end up having but uh obviously i have to put in a few days of research depending on what i am broadcasting uh, i guess so to give an example for overwatch contenders which is two days a week of broadcasts yep. uh, i'll typically do one day of preparation per week for that so i'll go over the team i'll see if there's been any roster changes what kind of storylines we're trying to build throughout the season how the team's form is going any sort of relevant information any kind of storylines that we can build for that particular broadcast uh, and then obviously that gets shared around with all the other casters that are working on any particular broadcast and uh, we sort of try to develop a storyline uh together um so that's i guess the, the prep side of things and the research side of things but then obviously also there's that um, head of broadcast talent kind of thing which is kind of a little bit of a loose term like really what my my real role is is mostly as a commentator but i do handle uh, a little bit of the scheduling of the other talent that work for us so uh, as far as like for example we have counter-strike dota yep. rainbow six we've got heaps of stuff going yes, on and, yep. and for the majority of those guys i'm scheduling when the broadcasts that they're required for are so i'll get the the actual broadcast plan and then i'll get told okay we need two broadcast two talent here three talent here blah 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 figure out a plan and so then i do that and and sort of send that off to all the other guys and say is this going to work for you guys how's this working and uh, i'm kind of like the, the middleman between esl and like the the production team and um the, the guys that are actually making the production yeah. happen and then the talent as well so yeah. if the talent has any any issues or concerns or whatever they come and talk to me and then i sort of figure that out from the business side of things as well and so that's the other sort of side, of side of my role. And if there's absolutely no broadcast going on at all, then uh, I guess I'm just kind of like every other guy that works here at ESL and uh, I'm putting in the hard yards in the warehouse sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and you've got hands in lots of different pies and, and keeping it all running. So my question is, and you mentioned it with research days, is how do you keep up with so many different esports? I think a lot of people who follow esports, including myself included, can be very... Um, 
daunted by the task of keeping up with day-to-day runnings of different esports. Even um, I hop between Dota 2, League of Legends, Overwatch. How do you keep up from a caster's point of view where you have to be informed about the roster changes and the storylines going on in the games? How do you how do you keep that going for such an extended period of time? It is quite tough, uh, especially when you're kind of jumping between one game to another in different sort of time periods. So if I'm regularly casting a particular game, then it's quite easy to keep up with things. So during the season for Overwatch or during the season for Counter-Strike, you kind of know what's going on because you're watching every single game anyway and you're sort of in that scene at that time. But for example, when the Overwatch scene ends and then I'm full on in Counter-Strike mode, my ideas of what's happening in the the Overwatch scene are a little bit maybe not quite on the mark. So I need to kind of go back at at the start of season three, for example, I'm going to need to go and, and sit down and have a look at how the rosters are shaping up and what's been going on in that off season period, because I'm not as in depth on that roster. So a lot of it is just doing research when it needs to be done in, in a sense, like for a lot of casual fans, I think what they would be doing is essentially just watching their favorite league or whatever. So let's say you're a Counter-Strike fan, you'd pretty much just watch all the Counter-Strike matches yeah. that you can, but, but you don't care about what's happening in Overwatch or what's happening in League of Legends or Rainbow Six or Dota 2. But yeah. for me, or I guess in, in my case, the three would probably be Counter-Strike, Overwatch and maybe PUBG or World of Tanks as, as okay. a sort of yep. every now and then kind of thing. Uh, so so what I need to do is I need to sort of very loosely kind of follow what's going on in all three at any given time. And then when I have a broadcast coming up for one of them, and that's when I really double down and focus in on uh, whatever particular game that is. So I sort of take it as I'm kind of getting in the zone with Overwatch or I'm kind of getting in the zone with Counter-Strike. And that's really what I focus on for that week or those few days. So, and I don't really pay too much attention to what else is going on. So uh, in, in a way, it is a little bit difficult, uh, but it seems to go okay. And, and a lot of it just comes from, you know, talking to people in the scene and catching up on VODs and, and that kind of thing. And it's just a lot of research and preparation. Yeah, definitely. And do you get much time to even play these games? Like, do you get time to actually jump in and get hands on with them uh, I, I typically do play a fairly decent amount of games maybe not as much as i would like to not as much as i used to uh, but i would say i probably have two to three hours a day where i, I on, on weekdays when i come home from work where yep. i can uh, mess around on certain games and obviously the weekends i've got as well uh, i typically don't play a whole lot of counter-strike mostly because i'm not very good at it and <laughs> i tend not to be someone that enjoys doing things that i'm bad at yep. uh, lately i've been really going hardcore into overwatch and so yep. i'm feeling a lot better about that uh, but for me, I think a lot of the preparation and, and the information that you get when you are a caster doesn't necessarily come from playing the game. Like, obviously, you need to have a basic understanding of how the game works, and you have to put in something like, I would say, you know, 200, 500 hours, whatever it may be, uh, before you end up casting that game to kind of just understand the game mechanically. Yeah. Uh, but once you have that solid basis, a lot of what you can talk about and what you understand about the, the scene and the game and itself is mostly actually going to come from watching the VODs and, and doing that research into how the players play and that kind of thing, not necessarily your own experiences in solo queue or whatever it may be. Yeah. And so Australia's esports scene it has come a long way, especially in the last five years. What, what do you think of the current state of the scene that we do have here in Australia? I think it's going well. Uh, it's certainly a lot better than what it used to be. It's been making leaps and bounds, really. We've had the inclusions of, for example, IEMs. Yep. Now we had Melbourne Esports Open as well in the last month. So that's two mega events uh, this year, which last year we only had one, and the year before that we only we had none. Uh, who's to say that next year we might not have three, four, five, who knows yep. uh, where we end up going. But I think this is kind of just a slow, natural progression, and it's definitely good to see. So I'm I'm definitely seeing a lot more instances of professionalism in the in the scene even like for example when it comes to counter-strike there's a lot more teams that are now being able to really fully focus on the game as opposed to it being sort of a a side thing which at the moment for a lot of the games in this region it still currently is Uh, but the more teams that we're going to be able to get that are fully salaried the more casters that are going to be fully salaried the more production teams that are going to be fully salaried uh, the better it is for the region so more and more of that budget that gets filtered back into esports is always going to be uh, good, and that's what we're seeing—a slow progression yep. throughout the years, and it's getting better and better. And it was really good looking from a fan's point of view at the Victorian government's effort with producing and contributing towards the Melbourne Esports Open. Um, what did you think of the event? Did you like looking back on it now? Is there stuff that you're really happy with that worked? Is there things you want to change for the next installment of the Open? 
Uh, I think I mean maybe I'm probably a little bit biased because it was an ESL event, and obviously I yeah, am definitely. an ESL employee. Yep. Uh, but I, I think it was quite a success uh, for particularly for like a, a first event. Uh, obviously, we've got things like IEM, uh, which came to Sydney and was like a massive standout huge. back in yep. 2017. Everyone was super, super hyped about it. It was huge. Uh, but it was already an established product, which everyone, you know, you know what IEM is if you're an esports fan. Yeah, but definitely. No one really knew what Melbourne Esports Open was until it yeah. kind of happened. So uh, I guess the, the turnout that we got was quite uh, respectable. I thought there was a reasonable amount of people there and it was quite a good event. And hopefully now that we've got that established baseline for what Melbourne Esports Open is, if it does inevitably happen uh, next year or the year after, who knows, uh, then people are kind of going to jump on board because they already know what it is and it, it might sort of start to build itself up. Um, but on the point of, you know, obviously Melbourne being involved or, or the Victorian government, I should say, being involved, I think that was really cool as well because then that's just another, uh, not necessarily sponsor, but that's another avenue for esports to get some income. And, and the more that we get, obviously, the better kind of events that we can put on. Uh, events like that, like Melbourne Esports Open or IEM, are very, very, very expensive. Um, and so you, you need to be able to kind of offset that with some sort of income somewhere. And it doesn't all just come from the ticket sales. So, you know, if, if uh, even like cities or anything, sponsors are super, super excited for these kinds of events. That's going to be really helpful for the uh, region. And so far, so good, I suppose. Yeah, and definitely with producing, say, a cast for the Melbourne Esports Open, I was there mostly on the Saturday for the Overwatch Contenders finals. Um, when you went through producing and preparing for that final, did you have to prepare differently from, say, your normal cast? Because of the percentage of people that were probably going to be in the stadium at the time of the finals that either don't play much Overwatch or have no idea or, you know, you've got you've got mums and dads that are bringing in their, you know, 10, 11-year-old kid to watch these events. How do you prepare for those to make it entertaining or inclusive for those people? Yeah, there was quite a bit of a discussion surrounding that, mostly from the talent team, um, obviously talking to Ben and uh, Pixie and Avril and Miles as to, and Genome as to how we wanted to kind of talk about Overwatch and that kind of thing. I was kind of a little bit more leaning on toward the side of we should sort of keep it uh, still to the same level as what we would expect to see from a normal Overwatch contenders mm -hmm. broadcast, but we did need to dumb it down a little bit yep. in the sense that we, we specifically, as one example, were really talking about what our usage of goats should be because yeah. obviously if you're an overwatch fan you know what goats is but mm -hmm. if you don't know what overwatch is and you this is your first time at a, an event like this you you hear these guys talking about goats and like i don't see goats yeah, anywhere no what on earth yep. are these guys talking about so we sort of settled on uh, the first time the first usage of goats in you know the map or or the series or whatever we would kind of explain what it was or just sort of name drop you know this is what this composition kind of means but we would continue to say goats and, and it, it seemed to work out okay. I, I did talk to a guy afterwards and he sort of said to me, like, didn't really know what you were talking about when you said goats, but it kind of started to click toward the end there. And I was like, okay, maybe we didn't really hit the mark with that one. Uh, but there was a concerted effort uh, to kind of appeal to an audience that wouldn't necessarily be Overwatch fans because Melbourne Esports Open, while it had Overwatch there and Overwatch was one of the mainline games, it wasn't an Overwatch event. So we couldn't guarantee that all of the people watching were going to be Overwatch fans, so we did need to try and make an effort uh, in that respect. Yeah, and I guess a feather in your hat is I did have one of our listeners who was at the event who were just coming to because they enjoy gaming um, actually came up and spoke to me after and said, I'm actually enjoying this, uh, watching this Overwatch because the casters seem to be making an effort to help me understand what's going on. Yeah, That's, and that, that was what we tried to do. Yeah, yeah, they he, he really understood um, exactly what was going on, so it's fantastic to see more and more people watching Overwatch and getting involved with it. Um, so what do you see for, this is a big question, I guess. What do you see for the Australian, um, esports scene in the next 12 months? What do you see in your, let's say crystal ball for, for what should be happening in the next 12 months for us? Uh, I mean, it's quite hard because typically for the year, you kind of have an idea of what's going to happen. Um, like for example, at the start of the year, we knew that Overwatch Contenders was going to be three seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, for Counter Strike, we knew that AU1 NZ Championship was going to be two seasons. Uh, we knew that there was a good chance that we were going to have ESL Pro League here. So, as far as I know, like for next year, I don't really know what's actually uh, on the cards. Like I have to expect that Overwatch Contenders is going to come back. I have to expect that Counter Strike is still going to be in the AU1 NZ Championship. I don't see us going backwards at all. Um, but past the the end of new year i really don't actually know what's going to be happening in 2019 
in, in my ideal world, I think we just progress on how we have been at the moment. Obviously, I'd love to see more uh, funding and, and more exposure for a lot of the things that I do end up casting, uh, but it maybe it's not so realistic just yet. Uh, but I do think that at the moment, things are progressing along very, very nicely in the Australian region. And if they continue to improve the way that they have been in the last few years, so if we continue to see that same growth as we did from 2016 to 2017 and 2017 to 2018, uh, then from 2018 to 2019, I think things are going to go pretty well. And obviously, another one of those big things is going to be how those mega events do go next yeah. year. I'm quite uh, excited to see if I am 2019 or Melbourne Esports Open 2019 are yeah. going to be a thing again. So very, very keen for those two events. Yeah, no, definitely. So I guess a question I've had, and it's, it's always interesting, uh, talking to Punk last week in regards to Overwatch contenders and the team setup and everything, do you think it it helps the esports scene with companies like Blizzard coming in and having such a strong interrelationship with their league so as overwatch contenders but having that responsibility and that ruling that they can only have overwatch like already approved sponsors on any jerseys and everything i know sponsorship for teams is very important for mm. their income and how they can um support themselves with overwatch having that ruling of they can only have the the couple of sponsors that's already approved is that a negative for the scene or is it still a positive that blizzard is so involved with esports in australia well i mean i guess you got to take the context of if we didn't have blizzard having that hands-on approach here in the region then we probably wouldn't have overwatch contenders yeah. in general so it probably doesn't matter what kind of sponsors exactly. you have on your jersey at the overwatch exactly. contenders land um i mean look to be fair for me like it's obviously a great thing because it does give me more to cast and mm -hmm. Like I said, if they weren't doing this, then Overwatch contenders wouldn't exist. Um, and the scene might not be quite nearly as developed as it is right now. I yep. know that the, the, the teams and the players have kind of gone through quite a lot of uh, growth in just the two seasons of Overwatch Definitely. contenders that we've had so far. I mean, you look at season one finals to season two finals, then there is that obviously that jump as well. Uh, so I think it's actually a good thing. Um, but I'm speaking from uh, a talent perspective, yep. uh, not necessarily from a team or a player mm -hmm. or an org perspective. I think in general, you, you definitely could make an argument that it does make life maybe a little bit more of a headache uh, for the teams, but it's got to be a bit of a labor of love in the end. Yep. Uh, I do think that it is a net benefit across the board uh, if, if a company is involved with their game so much uh, because it just does lead to so many more opportunities. Yep. Um, so I'm going to take a moment to indulge myself and my love of Overwatch. Jordan, what do you think of Overwatch currently? How do you see the meta that has evolved through Overwatch season, Overwatch contenders even, season one and two, and the changes that we've seen to teams, the the overall rise in not just quality of the cast and the streams, but the quality of the gameplay and the quality of the athletes that we're seeing involved in the game now. Yeah, well, there's a few questions in that one. I think as far as the meta is concerned, I actually really enjoyed the last season uh, because the meta changed up so much. I mean, obviously in season one, we really just had pretty much dive compositions and that's it. Now we had the double sniper, we had goats, we had dive, we had a lot of different variations, triple tank, triple support, that kind of thing. Uh, so there was a lot of variability for uh, a lot of the Overwatch players. And, and I like that from a viewing perspective because you Definitely. get to see something a little bit different uh, rather than just watching the same thing over and over again. And it makes things a little bit less predictable, which is always uh, exciting. And I guess, the, again, the same can be said uh, for the teams. Like, obviously, they've improved quite a lot from season one um, into season two and I'm sure the same can be said into season three uh, a lot of roster changes and that always is still something new to kind of keep an eye on um, which is always exciting it's more things to talk about uh, on one hand it is good to have stable rosters because it generally does lead to better teams and, mm -hmm. that, and that kind of thing but these change-ups in rosters you always get to see this amalgamation of players that you might have always wanted to see play together but you've not been able to see that yet so I mean, I think at the moment Overwatch in the Australian region is doing very, very well, and I'm uh, really enjoying casting it and really enjoying watching it. Um, and I hope that the meta is going to continue to be as variable as it was in Season 2. Yeah, definitely. And do you think Season 3 is going to have a proper contender for the Sydney Drop Bears? They've been so dominant in the mm. last two seasons, and, and they are having big changes with Color Hex moving on to, you know, possibly Pastures Greener um, mm. with American contenders. Do you think the, the overall cream of the crop is going to rise up to, to challenge them properly? It's hard to say, isn't it, really? Because it could be a very meta-dependent thing, although you could probably make the argument that it's not, given that they've now won on two separate yeah. uh, seasons, which have had very vastly different metas. Uh, I, I mean, 
Dark Sided, the team that was probably their closest competitor this season, has folded. Uh, a lot of their players are looking for teams and trying to figure out what they're going to be doing next. So uh, that's a bit of a, a setback, I think. I really did like that roster, but they've obviously gone their separate ways and trying to figure things out. Uh, Order's probably the next closest one to them. And as far as I've seen so far, they're not making any roster changes. Mm -hmm. But again, Overwatch season hasn't started. There's still a lot of time for things to, to happen. And yep. we'll have to see how things pan out with all of these free agents uh, around the place. Uh, I personally don't see anyone catching Sydney Drop Bears mm -hmm. uh, in the next season, even with losing color hex they were obviously without color hex in season one and they yeah. did win that grand final quite yeah. comfortably the season didn't go quite as well for them at the time but mm -hmm. i do think that there's quite a lot of free agents right now that are very very strong dps players and obviously they're looking to fill a dps slot so the the natural progression for sydney drop bears is that in theory they should get the next best dps player that was available in the region right now anyway and i think they should still be the best team in the region they've got some very very strong players on their roster and I don't think anyone's going to catch them for season three. Yeah, no, it's crazy. And I can't wait for season three to see exactly what happens, especially with the players from Darksided who made themselves quite fan favorites during the uh, Melbourne Esports Open and the Grand Finals. So hopefully we'll see some more growth from those players as towards that in Contender season three. Now, leading up to the end of our interview, you've, you've got the ability to go back and you can now talk to the future Jordan Mays. You can give him some advice or give anybody some advice who want to be casters, who want to be personalities on an analyst, if I can talk. Um, what do you say? What, what's your one golden piece of advice that you can give? I think if I had to go and give myself advice, personally mm -hmm. speaking, I would have said to um, just go for it. Like you, I, When I started casting, I was maybe a little bit worried of underperforming mm -hmm. on a stage that might be too big for me. Yep. Uh, so I not necessarily knocked back opportunities that I could have had, but I did mm -hmm. sort of uh, limit myself in a way. I sort of said, oh, you know, I might need a little bit more practice before I, I take advantage of this. And, and that maybe would have let me miss the boat uh, once or twice uh, in a way so that would be my personal advice for myself just give it a go if you've got that opportunity take it if you ruin it if you screw it up you know at least you gave it a try right because what's worse not doing it or i guess doing it and, and maybe failing you know you can at least learn from your mistakes in that sense uh but nowadays i think there is a bit of a different kind of uh expectation of casters when yeah, it gets definitely. to the big stage uh, there's probably a lot, a lot more pressure on the top guys than there was back then uh, when we were going through a lot of development um, these days i think really the best advice i can give to people that want to be a caster is to just get out there and actually just start casting because a lot of the time you see guys that you know they're like oh how do i get into this what do i do well the simple fact of the matter is that you can cast anything you want just put it on your channel go and watch an overwatch league vod cast over it and send it to someone or maybe someone's going to see it. Uh, if you come to me and you say, hey, Elfish guy, I'd like to cast for ESL. Uh, I'm really, really interested in Overwatch. And I'm like, okay, uh, who are you? And, and you're just like, oh, I just like to cast. Uh, I've never casted before, but I want to give it a try. It's like, <laughs> what, what's in it for me to give you a chance <laughs> to cast yep. Overwatch for ESL or for anyone else if I had any other opportunities that I could lead your way. Um, you need to have a body of work before you kind of approach uh, people. So the best way that you can do that is to just make your own VODs. I know there's a lot of a lot of organizations out there um, that do operate uh, for newer casters and, and do a lot of online broadcasts and you can jump in with any of them. Obviously, it's not going to be paid work, uh, but realistically, when I look at how I kind of made my way into the industry, I did almost two or three years of unpaid work and sometimes flying myself to events. So it's not going to be easy to get into, but if you have that passion and you really want to do it, um, which you will figure out whether or not you want to do it after doing it a few times, um, then you can kind of go for it. And you are kind of always got to look at the, the long-term future. It's not going to be uh, something that's going to come quickly. It, it could take six months, 12 months, a year, two years uh, before you really get that big gig. But once you do get that big gig, then people are going to take notice and uh, you'll get more and more. And they say, once you, have it then you've got too much and you start having to turn things down and that's certainly been the case for me um more and more as i've kind of progressed through my career yeah. i've had a lot of opportunities that i would have really loved to have uh, worked on but it, at a certain point you have to be like okay is this worth it versus this and you kind of have to make that decision and then that's where that trickle down effect starts to come if i turn something down and then the next person turns something down and the next person turns something down then maybe it ends up being yeah. uh, we're at with else. you know Joe Blow, who's just started casting. And yep. that was kind of how I made my sort of uh, entrances into into the scene. Mm -hmm. When people sort of turned things down, uh, inevitably it trickled all the way down to me here in Australia. And, and now here we are. Here we are. Okay, mm -hmm. so to finish up the interview, two on-the-spot quick questions. 
First one, what's your favorite esport to cast? <laughs> That's a loaded question, isn't that it? That is because definitely a loaded question. I'm if I say you... one thing or another at the moment, uh, one, <laughs> one community is not going to be too happy with me. Oh, no. Uh, I, I actually think at the moment it probably is Overwatch. Mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoy watching... Uh, all of the games. I think there's something to be said for being able to watch all of the games that are relevant. Uh, when it comes to Counter-Strike, obviously I love casting Counter-Strike, but it's very hard to sometimes keep up with how things are, are happening because there's just so much going on. Yeah. Uh, but for Overwatch, I know exactly what I say when it comes to Overwatch and it comes to the storyline that I'm building is 100% correct because yeah. I've cast every single game of the Overwatch contenders uh, and I know exactly what's going on, uh, yeah. but I can't say that necessarily for Counter-Strike. So that's a kind of a feel-good thing for me. And I could say the same thing about uh, World of Tanks when I was casting WGL. Yep. I did every single uh, APAC game, so I knew exactly what was going on, and it made storyline building a, a lot easier. And um, yeah, I mean, I it's very hard. You know, it's kind of like picking your favorite child, right? Yep. Um, Definitely. And I even, even had a lot of fun casting PUBG when I was able to do that once, so I'd love to cast some more PUBG, but it's just not an opportunity that's presented itself mm -hmm. uh, very, very recently. So. I guess at the moment it's Overwatch, but it's a pretty close race. Yep. And so this might have a similar answer. Somebody who's come in, they've said, right, I really want to watch esports, but I don't play any of the games. What should I watch? Where should I start? Mm. Well, it kind of depends, like, what you're kind of looking for. I guess mm -hmm. if you are a completely new viewer to esports, uh, I think Counter-Strike is probably the one at the moment. It's very, very easy game to understand on the surface, but there is quite a lot of depth there. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at a game like Overwatch or League of Legends or Dota 2, if you're playing that game, you can understand what's going on. But even sometimes when you're playing the game, you yeah, are going to no, lose a lot no, of stuff. There's yes. <laughs> heaps of stuff going on on the screen. Um, yep. But for Counter-Strike, it's much more basic just from the, the fundamental mm -hmm. mechanics of the game. So it's a little bit easier to, to pick up in that sense. So... If I was to give a recommendation, I would say probably Counter-Strike would be number one. Um, and it's also one of the biggest esports at the moment as well, which does have quite a lot of exciting moments and quite a lot of very, very good storylines. And a, lot's go a lot is going on for, for Counter-Strike at the moment. So uh, it's definitely a good one to, to jump into as a first esport if you were to watch one. Perfect. So you heard it here first. If you're new to esports and you want to watch something, go check out Counter-Strike. Thank you so much, Jordan, for giving up your time after work on this Friday. Um, this is your time to, you know, guiltlessly shill yourself and anything that you're involved with or you want people to watch. Uh, well, I guess obviously I have to shout out my Twitter. It's at Elfishguy or just look up Jordan Mays. You'll probably be able to find me pretty easily. Uh, I would encourage everyone to watch the ESL Pro League APAC season, which is on right now. We're doing a lot of Counter-Strike uh, for ESL at the moment and obviously also Overwatch Contenders Season 3 when it does kick off later on in the year. I'll be casting that as well, so super keen for that. So that's it pretty much for me. But uh, yeah, make sure you check everything out. Check all that out. I'll have all of Jordan's Twitter and stuff in the links below. So click on that. Give him a follow. Said Kieran, say Kieran sent you and apologize for whatever I've done in this interview. Thank you once again for watching the video. Please check out all of our podcasts and interviews and articles on explosionnetwork.com. Give us a like on the Twitters at ExplosionPod. Or if you want to yell at me in person, at your boy Ringo on Twitter. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you once again, Jordan. I'll catch Cheers. you next time.